من الشيطان الرجيم He seek the protection of God from shaitan who has been expelled from God's kingdom of special mercy because of his arrogance and his defiance. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We humbly turn to God and ask for his special grace and guidance and blessings because he is the all perfect one and he is the all merciful one. And His special grace and mercy is available abundantly and eternally to those who believe in Him and who submit to His will. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad wa alihi al-Tahirin. And we send our salutations and greetings on the Holy Prophet and on his Holy Progeny who are the best guides for mankind till the end of time. Elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. We were discussing Surah Dahar chapter 76 which has 31 verses and uh, one way to appreciate the importance of a Surah is to look at the merit of its recitation. Tonight being the anniversary of the birth of the fifth holy Imam Muhammad bin Ali al Baqir alayhi salam. I tried to get some of the hadith which have been narrated from him about this surah. So, incidentally, this riwayah which says that Man qara'a surah hal ata fi ghadat al khamis. Everyone, anyone who recites this surah on every Thursday morning, Zawwajahullahu min al Hurilain, that Allah will give him a special reward in Jannah, wa kana ma'a Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he shall be in the company of the Holy Prophet. Mere recitation doesn't work and deserve and qualify a person to deserve this reward. It is recitation with understanding and reflection and action that brings a person closer to the lifestyle of the Prophet in the dunya and therefore in the company of the Prophet in the Akhirah when the truth shall be manifested. The second riwayah is from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa whosoever recites this surah, then jazahu kana jazahu min rabbihi jannatan wa harira. Then the special reward for him from God will be jannah and harira, which incidentally is mentioned in the surah, that these abrar perform certain actions, they fulfill their obligations and they fear their Lord and they feed the needy and the orphan and the prisoner. As a reward Allah gives them jannah. Jazahum bima sadaru jannatan wa harira. So if we are to achieve and attain this reward of paradise, it is again not only recitation, but recitation with reflection and reflection with action. And the main action that needs to be taken is sabr, sabr in different areas uh, of life. 31 verses which can be uh, broken up into paragraphs. Number one is an introduction, I number one to four that Allah's special creation of man for a specific purpose and facilitation for man and enablement of man to achieve that purpose. And then the result, those who reject what's going to happen to them. Introduction. The largest paragraph, I number 5 to I number 22, discusses the Abra that they are the ones who shall be granted a special status in Jannah because of specific actions that they perform. And then a lengthy description of the different rewards in Jannah for them. Ayah 23 to 26. The Prophet faced opposition, rejection, persecution of the followers from the disbelievers. How should he face this huge challenge? 27, 28, the consequences of 
the ashrar, those who reject the truth and commit evil. And finally, the concluding verses 29 and 31. So, ayah number 1, 2, 3, and 4 is an introduction. We've already covered this, but this time I want to revisit the verses, but from the perspective of Imam Baqir alayhi salam. Incidentally, we have riwayat in the tafsir of these verses from Imam Baqir alayhi salam. So, ayah number 1. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل أتى على الإنسان حين من الدهر لم يكن شيئا مذكورا Has not there come a time, a period, a long period of time on man when he was nothing worthy of mention or he was something but yet unworthy of mention either of the two interpretations possible. The riwayah which is narrated from the holy Imam Al-Baqir he says, كَانَ شَيْئًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ مَذْكُورًا No, he was something but he wasn't something worthy of mention. Another riwayah is that he was something in God's mind, if you can use that term, in God's knowledge, in God's plan, in God's scheme of things, he was already there. But in the physical universe, he had not yet come into existence. كَانَ مَذْكُورًا فِي الْعِلْمِ In the ilm of Allah, وَلَمْ يَكُلْ مُكَوَّنًا But he was not yet physically born and present. So man's creation undergoes several stages. One stage is the physical creation. But prior to that, there is a stage where he is something but unworthy of mention. And even prior to that, he is nothing physically but something in the mind of God, in the plan of God, in the eternal, unending, limitless, timeless knowledge of God. He was something. And this is a powerful uh, interpretation because if you recognize that you are something here because somebody planned you to be here. Before you came here, you were there somewhere else. Not physically, but as an object of the knowledge and the consideration of God. And that's very important. The highest, most perfect being planned you, thought about you. That's very important. Um, and therefore look at this interpretation and this appreciation of this reality. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Uh, The riwayah says, he addressed Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says, قُلْ مَا أَوَّلُ نِعْمَةٍ أَبْلَاكَ اللَّهُ بِهَا وَأَنَّ عَمَا بِكَ عَلَيْكَ وَأَنْ عَمَهَا عَلَيْكَ Which is the first ni'mah which you can imagine, which Allah granted you. Our relationship to our Lord, if it is based on the appreciation of the blessings that He has granted us, it will arouse in ourselves a feeling of appreciation, of gratitude, acknowledgement, and therefore uh, submission to His will to use those ni'mah for the purpose for which it was designed. But we need to appreciate what those ni'mah are. So when the Prophet asks Imam Ali, Imam Ali answers, that foremost ni'mah which Allah has granted me and khalaqani walam aku shay'an madhkura He created me when I was nothing worthy of reference physically but something worthy of reference in his knowledge, in his plan. Some time ago I had a call from uh, a lady in distress she says, in the environment I live, I have tried to solve my problem, but I couldn't. I'm being abused in my family, and my husband is mistreating me. He has a mistress, 
after me. He's abandoned me. He's not even providing adequately for me. Um, I've got marks all over my body of uh, physical uh, abuse. We're not even sharing the marriage bed as a husband and wife ought to. But I'm trapped. I can't do anything. I go and seek help because, because my husband happens to be uh, an important person. Uh, people are not ready to help me. And uh, then she becomes emotional and she starts crying. She says, please, Shaykh, help me. Um, I've got no other way to go, otherwise I'll commit uh, suicide. I mean, I'm sure God will forgive me for that because I have no other way to go. This is the answer, this ayah. If you recognize that your presence here in the world was planned, you didn't come here because you wanted it so. You came here because somebody else wanted you to come here. The fact that it was chosen that in a particular period of time, the 20th, 21st century, in a particular place on the earth, let's say in East Africa, to a particular uh, tribe, to a particular family, to a particular individual, you shall be granted all these decisions. You will have certain specific characteristics, physical, biological, um, and also non-material characteristics. All these things were planned. Somebody wanted you to be here, that's why you're here. And therefore, life is a gift to you, and therefore you have no right to take it away. Whatever, whatever circumstances you may be trapped in, it is no justification for suicide. But that's after you constantly remind yourselves about the different ni'mah, and of course about this specific reality. The Prophet says, Sadaq. When Imam Ali Ali replied that this is the greatest ni'mah that I have. Ayah number two. Inna khalaqna al-insana min mutfatin amshajin nabtalihi. So his physical presence now is the second stage in creation. After him becoming the object of God's knowledge and God's plan in God's timeless knowledge. The second phase he is particles scattered unworthy of mention. Number three, he comes to a stage where he becomes aggregated, combined and a process of development begins. We created man stage by stage, one stage of which is uh, notfa, small drop of fluid, amsha jin, which is a mixture. This interpretation of amsha jin to mean a mixture, what sort of mixture? has man developed from. So the fifth holy Imam says that Amshaj means ma or rajuli wal marati jamia the fluid from the man, the fluid from the woman, they mix up and they produce this human being. So fertilization is being referred to. That the characteristics that this fetus or embryo will develop is the result of certain characteristics inherited from the male, others from the female, in some cases domination, in some cases uh, recession of those qualities. he, And we created man so that we put him to a stage of bala. What does bala mean? Again, Imam Ali Salam Baqir. So that we may test him. So that we may enable his potential now to actualize, to grow and to fruitify. In order to enable him to achieve that goal of perfection, we then granted him different faculties, the most important of which are the sight and the hearing uh, faculty. There's a long hadith narrated from the Imam Ali Salam uh, regarding the how our presence on the earth and everything granted to us on the earth now becomes a test. 
sight and hearing are examples. Every other faculty that enables man to recognize the truth, to accept the truth, to act on the truth, and to live by it, now becomes a means of testing him. So if I can just quote uh, certain passages from, from that riwayah. The riwayah is in Al-Kafi. Habib Sajistani or Habib Sistani uh, says that I heard Sami'atu Aba Ja'far alayhi salam that Imam Baqir alayhi salam uh, reported and explained this. It's a long riwayah um, and uh, somewhere in the middle Imam, Imam says that God talked to Adam when Adam questioned him the purpose of creation. He says, I am the creator, wa ana al alim aw khaliqul alim, and I am the one who has granted differences between uh, the creation. Some are powerful, some are weak, some are rich, some are poor, some have got better characteristics, some have got lesser characteristics. Wa bi mashi'ati yamdi fihim amri, and it is my wisdom that rules over them. La tabdila li khalqi. Nobody can come and change and alter my creation because my creation is the best. And I've created them for the purpose of worship because worship is the best way to achieve perfection because worship means focus the whole of your life and all the God-given energies your mental energy, your physical energy, your emotional energy, your spiritual energy directed all towards the all perfect being. Necessarily that energy will be used to achieve perfection. So, خَلَقْتُ الْجَنَّةَ لِمَنْ أَطَاعَنِي and خَلَقْتُ النَّارَ لِمَنْ كَفَرَ بِي وَعَصَانِي and I created the paradise as the final abode for those who obey me and therefore achieve perfection and the fire for those who reject me and therefore deserve my damnation. And I created all of you so that I may, te that I may test you. خَلَقْتُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةَ وَالْحَيَاةَ وَالْمَوْتَ وَالطَاعَةَ وَالْمَعْصِيَةَ وَالْجَنَّةَ وَالنَّارَ All of it for the purpose of testing. And I created specific differences in the surah, the appearance, in the jism, in the color, in life terms, in the provisions, in the, in the degree of worship, in the degree of rebellion. Some of them are achieve salvation, some damnation, some are blind, some have vision, some are tall, some are short, some are beautiful and pretty, some are ugly, some are knowledgeable, some are ignorant, some are rich, some are poor, some are healthy, some are sick, some are disabled, some are fully able-bodied. All of this is a test. The ayah is very brief. The ayah simply says that uh, Allah created man and granted him faculties so that he may be tested. The riwayah of Imam Baqir then says, everything that is granted to man is a test. Whether you have wealth is a test, whether you have health is a test, whether you're sick is a test, whether you're poor is a test, whether you're pretty is a test, whether you're ugly is a test. Everything, your color, your appearance, your strength, your weakness, everything becomes a test. Essentially, the purest gift which is untainted is the soul. Everything else could be damaged, doesn't matter. But the soul that is given to the human being is the most perfect, purest gift which is given equal to everyone. The rest differs in the degree uh, of its health or sickness. I have a three. So once we have enabled him to achieve perfection by giving him the inner faculties to seek the truth and understand the truth and to accept the truth, to facilitate him finding the truth, we send the message, the message and the messenger. Inna hadaynahu sabila, imma shakiran wa imma kafura. Then man can respond either by becoming a believer or a disbeliever. 
But the ayah doesn't say believer, disbeliever. The ayah says you either become a person who is thankful or a person who is ungrateful. Belief and disbelief is taken to be equivalent to gratitude and ingratitude. Again, the Imam alayhi salam, the riwayah from the fifth holy Imam says, Imma akhidan fashakir wa imma tarikan fakafir. Either you accept the guidance, therefore you are thankful. Or you reject the guidance, therefore you are ungrateful. It is not possible to be given all the faculties to seek the truth, to find the truth, to know the truth, to accept the truth, and man rejects the truth. But that is being ungrateful for all the for all the gifts that have been granted to him. Connected to this is this famous Sahabi who incidentally lived up to the time of Imam Baqir salam, Jabir bin Abdullah al Ansari. There is a riwayah narrated by him from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ Every newborn is born on the fitra of God-seeking nature. This is given to everyone. Whether he's born in a Muslim family or a non-Muslim family, everyone has been granted this God-seeking nature. حَتَّى يُعَبِّرَ عَنْهُ لسانه. And then he is allowed to grow till he reaches a level of maturity where, whereby now he can express himself. Expression, articulation as a sign of mental maturity. فَإِذَا عَبَّرَ عَنْهُ لِسَانُهُ إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا Once he expresses, he either is grateful, he is properly used in senses. How he is ungrateful by rejection if he is abused and improperly used them. Ayah number four. إِنَّا أَعْتَدْنَا لِلْكَافِرِينَ سَلَاسِلَ وَأَغْلَالًا وَسَعِيرًا We have definitely already prepared beforehand, even before man reaches Akhirah. It is already ready. سَلَاسِلَ The chains. أَغْلَالًا وَسَعِيرًا And uh, the blazing fire. I came across, when I was checking the riwayat of Imam Bakr salam, I came across this interesting riwayat from one of the Sahabi of the Prophet, Abu Darda. Abu Darda would often keep on saying and give this piece of advice. Allah threatens that if you reject the clear message brought by this hard-working, honest, upright messenger who sacrificed everything for the sake of God in delivering the message. He left nothing and no stone unturned in carrying out his duty. He did his best. The message is the most clear. Now if you reject, then the punishment is the chains. So one description of the chain is the chains will be on your feet and you'll be dragged. Another description is the chains will be tied on your hand to your neck. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ And وَجَعَلْنَا فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ أَغْلَالًا And we shall put chains on their necks, the collars. فَهِيَ إِلَى الْأَغْقَانِينَ And they shall reach their chains. فَهُمْ مُقْرَحُونَ And it shall be so huge that their faces will be forced, lifted up. So your hands will be tied. Basically you won't be, you won't be mobile. Though you will see the signs, though you will see the uh, indicators, but you will fail to move. This is a physical comparison of a spiritual state of paralysis. Paralysis to respond to the truth. Kwanini, because all this individual has done things in the dunya to habituate himself to evil to a point that he becomes addicted and in prison and therefore paralyzed. These are the chains. Abu Darda says, but before those chains become manifest on the Day of Judgment as a punishment, and your hands are tied, use your hands for the right purpose. Irfa'u هَذِهِ الْأَيْدِي إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ قَبْلَ أَن تُغَلْ بِالْأَغْلَالِ Use your hands to make dua, turn to God, listen to Him, obey Him, discipline yourself. 
to live a God-fearing life before these hands are then tied to your necks as punishment. So notice how the uh, training of the Prophet to the Sahaba was that they would read the Quran not for the sake of recitation but for the sake of recitation and then reflection and then application. So what does this imply for my practical life today? If the Kafir is going to be chained, well, I should do something to avoid that chaining. I number five onwards now is the description of the abrar. In al abrara yashrabuna min kaasin kana mizajuha kafura. I couldn't find a riwayah about Imam Baqir alayhi salam, but there's an interesting riwayah from Imam Hussein alayhi salam, where the Imam is quoted to say, "Kullu ma fi kitab Allah min qawlihi in al abrara." Every ayah in the Quran which discusses the abrar basically refers to the Ahlul Bayt. Ma arada bihi illa Ali ibn Abi Talib wa Fatima wa Ana wa Hassan. This abrar in the Quran refers to Ali and Fatima and Hassan and myself. Li anna nahnu abrarun bi abaina wa ummahatina. وَقُلُوبُنَا عَمِلَتْ بِالطَّاعَاتِ وَالْبِرُّ مُبَرَّأَةٌ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَحُبِّهَا وَأَطَعْنَ اللَّهَ فِي جَمِيعِ فَرَائِضِهِ وَآمَنَّ بِوَحْدَانِيَّتِهِ وَصَدَّقْنَا بِرَسُولِهِ Why is it that it is referring to us? وَسَبَابُ Our forefathers are pure, our mothers are pure, our hearts have always turned in submission and obedience to God. Three. Number four, our hearts are empty of any attraction to the deceptive dunya. Four. Number five, in all the commands that Allah has decreed and issued, we have obeyed. And number six, we have been firm in our faith in the unity of God and in the prophecy of the Prophet. Six qualities whereby Imam says, therefore we qualify to become Abrar. Lakin. This riwayah obviously has to be interpreted to mean that Abrar has several stages. The lower stage and medium stage and high stage. The highest stage is the one that applies to the Ahlul Bayt. But anyone who develops these six characteristics which the Imam has described, the fact that The fact that if there is obedience, if there is submission, if there is no distraction to the dunya, if there is acceptance of the unity of God and the prophecy of the prophethood, anybody can do that to the degree and to the intensity of these characteristics, the individual enters into the group of Abrar. What is this? drink of wine which will not intoxicate like the wine of the dunya. Where does it come from? Aynayn yashrabu biha ibadullah yufajjirunaha tafjira. Because they are total servants of God, totally in submission to God and to none else other than God, not to the desires, not to the dunya, not to the dictators, not to the devil. Therefore, they are granted this special power whereby not only they drink, in fact they can create the spring of that drink. Not only for themselves, but for others also. For others also is based on this riwayah from Imam salam. The fifth holy Imam says, Hiya aynun fi darid nabi. This is a spring which is located in the house of the Prophet يُفَجَّرُ إِلَى دُورِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ and the spring will be created to gush forth and supply the believers with this drink and also the Prophets. Obviously this is symbolic. We're not talking about a physical drink here. We're talking about the symbolic equivalence of a drink which when the soul comes into contact with it is satisfied, achieves tranquility and pleasure and comfort, it gets intoxicated from anything other than God and gets intoxicated with God, engrossed, occupied with God alone. That is the drink. That means the pure 
high perfect knowledge about God and the way to relate to Him is from the uh, the lifestyle, the thinking, the character and the belief of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt What is it that enables them to reach this high level? يُوفُونَ بِالنَّذْرِ وَيَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا كَانَ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا There was no riwayah here from the Imam, but in the next ayah there was a riwayah from the Imam. وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا You notice that they constantly gave food, food, these abrar. The riwayat of the Ahlul Bayt and also riwayat from the Muslim scholars indicate that this ayah was revealed in connection to the charity given by the members of the Ahlul Bayt. In the riwayat by Imam Baqir alayhi salam, ala hubbihi has been interpreted to mean ala shahwatihi. They gave food though they loved it. They had shahwa, they had desire for the food because they remained hungry and they were thirsty. But despite that intense need and desire for food, they overcame it and they gave out charity. And they sacrificed and they gave it out. They gave it out to whom? Miskinan wa yatiman wa asira. Miskin, Imam alayhi salam says, Miskin min masakin al Muslimin, a Muslim miskin. Yatim min yatam al Muslimin. Asir min usara al Mushrikin. The Asir was a non Muslim. And finally, the description now ends here. From this ayah onwards, then there is now description of the reward. We have fed you only for the sake of God. We don't want any thanks and appreciation from you or any acknowledgement from you. Did they speak these words? To the miskin yatim and asir, or was it in their mind and motive? If it was in their mind and if it was spoken to these three, then these three could have reported to the others, and we would have known. But if it was something mental, if it was the motive they had, then Allah had to inform us. Which of the two? Imam Ali Salam Al Baqir says, "Wallahi ma qalu hada lahum." I swear by God, they never spoke these words to the miskin and yatim and asir. We don't want any thanks from you. We don't want any return from you that you invite us. Whenever you get rich, come and pay us back. No, they never spoke these words. But it was their motive. Walakin fi anfusihim. It was there in the nafs. That was their motive. That was the attitude when they gave out the food. إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ Imam Ali Salam says that means أَطْعَمْنَاكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ For the sake of God, meaning وَطَلَبِ ثَوَابِهِ To get his thawab and reward. It doesn't matter for us if nobody is there to witness. If the recipient doesn't even thank us. If the recipient doesn't even pay us back because we know there is somebody who is watching and recording we know this universe is alive we know their angels we know our body is alive we know our body is recording we know the earth is recording we know time is recording we know everywhere there are witnesses in place there's no way a single minor act of goodness is done even if nobody watches but it will be recorded وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى Even if even it is the minutest action of goodness, it has been watched and therefore recorded. How 
could you achieve this high level of sacrifice? It's not wajib to give zakat or wajib to give sadaqah to a miskin and a yatim and a asir when you don't have it yourself and you have to go and beg from somebody to provide to feed them. It's not wajib. Sorry, uh, let me introduce you to someone who can feed you. And besides, we have very little. Why don't we share half to you and half to me? Where do they get the motive and the strength to be able to give whole share of theirs? This is the ayah. The previous ayah says, it is for the love of God. This ayah says, it is out of the fear of God. <laughs> we fear from our Lord a day which is frowning and fateful. We fear not any creatures, we fear the Creator only because of the sincerity and the deep love they have for God. And therefore, if you are sincere to God, it doesn't mean you won't fear God. True, the worship of God can be either out of fear, like slaves obey their masters, or it can be out of greed for reward, like a businessman who engages in a transaction to get some profit. Or worship can be of the third type whereby you pray and you obey because he is worthy of obedience and worthy of worship. And true, the third one is the highest. Lakini, it doesn't mean these individuals are not afraid of God. They have fear of God. It is through fear that they reach this level of high sincerity. And incidentally, Look at the ayah. The ayah says, we fear a day which will be frowning. Normally you would say, we fear a day on which the Lord shall punish and therefore people shall frown and people shall be uh, hopeless and people shall be disappointed and people shall be terrified on that day. So as a response they will frown. People will do that. But the ayah doesn't say that. The ayah says, we fear from our Lord a day, the day will be frowning. Again, it's the intensity of the fear and of the punishment of the day. It is as if the day would be frowning. Because everywhere you look, people would be frowning. It's as if the day is frowning. يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْ one of the uh, Mufassirin, I liked his comment, he says that if you want to escape frowning on the day of frowning, don't frown today on the orphan and the prisoner and the needy. So this incident uh, which is reported in the sources of Ahlul Bayt السلام, that this ayah refers to the Ahlul Bayt is also quoted in the Sunni sources, the almost more than 22 sources which can be listed Fakhr Razi al-Mafatih and Baytawi and Alusi and Barzanji and Qanduzi and Ibn Kathir and Tabari and Ibn Abil Hadid and Ibn Jawzi and Asqalani and uh, Baghawi and Ibn Athir and Ustul Ghaba. We have discussed the details of this incident. I will not repeat that. I would like to pause here before we continue because the remaining verses now are going to discuss the reward for this action and the motive of this action. It's very important to consider these motives. What is it that enables these individuals to carry out this high degree of sacrifice? Fear. Twice in this short passage, the word fear is mentioned. Again. Fear is so important as a motive to do something right. In fact, in Surah 38, Sad, Ayah number 26, and again in Surah number 70, Ayah number 27, fear is mentioned as a praiseworthy quality. If you have it, then you will be rewarded Jannah. As mentioned in uh, 
سورة المعارج شابتر سبنتي والذين يصدقون بيوم الدين والذين هم عن عذاب ربهم مشفقون they are fearful of the punishment of their Lord in سورة 38 صاد Ayah number 27, Allah describes a situation where those who have no fear, they end up becoming sinful. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَضِلُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ You see these people who have strayed away from the path of God. The right type of behavior, the right type of character, the right type of belief and thinking and attitudes. They don't have them. They've strayed away. Do you know why? Do you know what's the problem? There's one big problem in them. And that is, بِمَا نَسُوا يَوْمَ الْحِسَابِ Because they forgot the day of Hisab. They have no fear. And because they had no awareness and recognition and reminding of that day of Hisab, they were led astray. So fear is a powerful motivator to do good, a powerful deterrent to avoid evil. And that is why throughout the Quran you find all prophets always mention as one important characteristic, characteristic about themselves is fear. So, إني أخاف إن عصيت عذاب إن عصيت ربي عذاب يوم عظيم. I fear the punishment which is going to be عظيم. Mentioned in Surah An'am, in Surah Araf, in Surah Yunus, in Surah Shu'ara, in Surah Zumar, and in Surah Ahqaf. It's that important. Different prophets have been mentioned when they talk to their Lord, when they talk to the disbelievers, when they talk to the mu'mineen, and when suggestions are made to them, why don't you uh, join our lifestyle? And they say, no, we fear our Lord. We fear the severity of the punishment of that day. In Surah Hud, chapter 11, ayah 3, إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَذَابًا إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ كَبِيرٌ In again same Surah Hud عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ يَوْمٍ أَلِيمٍ Again in the same Surah chapter 11 ayah number 84 from Prophet Shu'ayb that the عَذَاب is مُحِيطُ Ayah number 26 says that Nuh was sent to his people and he told them, I am a warner. Allah ta'abudu illallah. My message to you is you should worship and obey and follow and take your guidance and your lifestyle should be based on principles from God and God alone. إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ أَلِيمٍ I fear a day a day which is going to be painful. The day is frowning. The day is painful. The severity of the pain on that day. In the same surah, Prophet Shu'ayb, chapter 11, ayah number 84, Prophet Shu'ayb tells his people, وَإِلَىٰ مَدْيَنَا أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبَ And remember the time when we sent Shu'ayb to his people in Midian. قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ O my people, I'm a member from you. Ya أُعْبُدُ Allah, Worship God and God alone. Every affair of yours should be determined by God's command. Don't be strayed by your prophet seeking motives to do evil and be unfair in your business affairs. One of the economic problems at, at that time was uh, corruption. مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرُهُ There is no true power who is worthy of worship other than Allah. وَلَا تَنْقُصُ الْمِكْيَالَ وَالْمِيزَانِ Don't take more money and give less commodity. إِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ بِخَيْرُ I see you are good people. Why are you uh, following the evil example of some corrupt people? إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ مُحِيطٌ I fear a day which is muhit, a day which is all encompassing. You can't escape. The day whose punishment is inescapable. 
In Surah number 14, Surah Mu'min, Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun, when he's presenting his arguments to Bani Israel, why they should listen to Musa and not to Fir'aun, at one stage in his argument, he mentions, I fear for you, I fear the day, Yawm Tanad, ayah number 32. He says, Wa ya my people, I'm from you, but I've seen the truth, and I see you are going on the wrong path, so I need to warn you. I warn you from a day, serious day. You know one very important characteristic of that day? إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ يَوْمَ التَّنَادِ It will be the day of Nida. People will cry out, Help! They will call back, Help! Everybody is going to be helpless. The day of calling out, the day of crying out, the day of wailing, everyone is going to be helpless and therefore hopeless. And because there is no scope for guidance anymore. Whatever guidance was there was in the dunya. In chapter 13, the fear is attributed to a specific action on that day. Not the punishment, but the hisab is mentioned as an example why a mu'min should fear that day. Surah 13 is Surah Ra'ad. I number 21 in the description of the Ulul Albab, Allah says, Yakshawuna Rabbahum, they fear their Lord. Wayakhafuna su al hisab. They fear on that day the evil of the hisab. The evil of the hisab. It doesn't mean that Hisab is evil, Hisab is very good. The problem with it is the result would be those who are evil doers will suffer evil consequences. So the Hisab in that sense becomes evil. Oh no, evil in, uh, again according to the riwayah of Imam Sadiq, the son of Imam Baqir salam, he says no, here Su'ul Hisab doesn't mean that Allah is unfair, that e the accounting is evil and therefore you should fear. <laughs> that means you are fearing God's injustice, no, God is very just. Precisely it is his justice that makes the hisab become evil because his justice dictates that the hisab should be meticulous, should be accurate, should be to the last minutest detail, the zarra of sharr should be presented and taken account for. When you ask for every penny how it is spent, that is the su'ul hisab, though you're very just. Angels have been praised in Surah 16, ayah number 50, that they also fear their Lord, min fawqihim, one who is above them, the highest Lord. So notice, fear is mentioned throughout the Quran as a positive characteristic of angels, of prophets, and of the perfect mu'mineen, the ulul albab. What about the day of judgment is fearful? Obviously the punishment. So in Surah Ghashiyah, we are told that the punishment is akbar. akbar. Remember the punishment shall be the greatest. Allah is not great, Allah is the greatest. Akbar. Remember the remember the punishment of the day of judgment, which is going to be the greatest. In Surah Fajr, chapter 89, I 25. On that day, he shall punish a punishment which no one ever in power, is used as a punishment over the one under him. Fanini, so his power is unlimited. You can't escape his punishment. And of course that famous ayah in Surah Ma'arij which we recite in the Munajat of Imam Ali salam, whereby he says on that day the punishment shall be so great that people will want to escape the punishment by whatever means, even by selling their closest relatives. Take him, but save me. Chapter 17, ayah number 11. 
On that day, the mujrim and the criminal who has done evil purposely and willfully and knowingly. If he could find ransom and to escape from the punishment of that day, take my sons, punish them and save me. Take my wife. وَأَخِيهِ Take my brother وَفَصِيلَتِهِ And my whole tribe in whose shelter I grew up Take all of them but save me No, 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 that's not enough Take my whole community No, take my whole nation No, take everyone on the earth Punish them but save me وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ So that I get saved a description that the severity of the punishment is so great that even if a ransom were to be possible, the highest ransom is not enough. In Surah Mursalat, the severity of the punishment is described in these terms. Chapter 77, ayah number 30. That on that day, the mukaddibin shall be sent forcibly to the fire of hell. In taliku ila ma kuntum bihi to kaddibun. You were given the message. You were told about this reality. You understood it. You knew the messenger was honest and good and reliable and trustworthy. But you rejected. Now go to that which you have rejected. In Taliku ila Rillin the Thalafi Shuab. Go to a shade which is which has got three sides from above, from the right, and from the left. Go to a shade. Normally, in extremely hot temperatures, you would want to take shelter because even a physical shelter of a tree blocks the heat of the sun reaching you. That's comfortable. So here, a shade is mentioned. Go to the shade. And this shade, unfortunately, instead of being, being, being a cool shade, shall be la dhalilin wa la yughni min al-lahab. The shade, the shade itself is burning. It will not only provide no comfort; it itself will be burning with flames. And you know what sort of flames? Inha tarmi bi sharrin kal qasr. The enormity of the size of the flame of the fire shall be as great as the biggest building that you can think of, a palace. Burj al Arab. So you think you can escape? No. Ka'annahu jimalatun sofr. It's as if the enormity in size is like the huge yellow camel. The camel, do you see how huge it is? You can't face it, you can't escape it. And the yellow, the yellow indicating the fire. Uh, and finally, in Surah A'la. In Surah Al-A'la, one particular description about the fire of hell is that it is so severe that you would wish to die. It's better I wish I, 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 wish I could commit suicide. Yeah, the ayah says, sorry, you won't be able to die. Neither will he be able to live. Hayat. It's miserable suffering. So you would want to die. But death has itself died. Death will have been made to die before you go to Jahannam or Jannah. So the severity of the punishment is mentioned in different terms. I stop here by mentioning some of the characteristics of the fire of hell as mentioned in the Quran. This fire of hell is going to be fueled not by fossil fuels, it's going to be fueled by human flesh. People shall be the fuel. The more people go in, the more burning and blazing it becomes. This fire is not an ordinary fire of the dunya. It's a fire which can identify and recognize a criminal from a distance. 
when it sees them, it shall groan in fury. Chapter 25, Surah Furqan, Ayah number 12. Allah says, إِذَا رَأَتْهُمْ When the fire sees them, they are approaching مِنْ مَكْهَانٍ بَعِيدٍ Even from a very far distance, سَمِعُوا لَهَا تَغَيُّظًا وَزَفِيرًا They shall hear very clearly, suddenly it's bellowing out and belching out in fury, waiting to attract them. Not only that, in ayah number 23 of Surah Fajr, Allah says, not only will it spot them from a distance, in fact, it will rush to them. The Jahannam will be made to move towards the criminal after it has identified. This is not an ordinary fire. The dunya fires don't do that. The dunya fires are not conscious. The dunya fires don't identify. It will rush towards the criminal, and at that moment he shall recognize, but it's too late. And then, خُذُوهُ فَغُلُّوهُ ثُمَّ الْجَحِيمُ صَلُّوهُ سُرْحَقَ Drag him to the center of and the core of the fire. And once he's inside the fire, this fire is going to break him up. Kalla Surah Humaza, chapter 104. Kalla layun bazanna fil hupama. They shall be discarded as rubbish into the hupama. Hupama is from hakum. Hakum is to break. The bone breaking, body breaking fire. They shall be crushed to the highest degree. They should be made into pulp, but they can't die. And this fire not only will burn them from without to within, this fire shall burn them from within to without. No dunya fire can do that. It's a fire which is inescapable. It shall encompass an envelope and it shall make escape impossible. And this will continue eternally. If an individual were to remind himself of this reality, one, if he were to repeat the recitation of these two, if he were to recall his own sinful past, three, if he were to realize that there is no way to escape this enormity of the punishment, four, it is not possible for this human being not to feel fearful and not to be afraid. Why is it, why is it that we're told that make it a habit on a regular basis every day, you must read the Qur'an, because the Qur'an has got a reminder about the reality everyone has to face. If we have got a constant diet of texting and watching TV and listening to the radio and reading the newspapers, <laughs> these are mundane affairs that will come and go. There's one reality nobody can escape. There must be a schedule plan every day where a portion of the verses of the Quran, there's simply there's, there are very few surahs in the Quran which have no mention of Jahannam. Very few surahs in the Quran we have no mention of Jannah. It's not possible for us to keep a regular habit of reading the Quran but that we are reminded of this fundamental reality and therefore we get closer and closer to the stage of the Abra. Let's pray to Allah on this. Holy auspicious night, we get the tawfiq to be able to be inspired by the guidance of Imam Baqir alayhi salam and then get closer to his spirituality and enter the elite group of the Abraham. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.